question for most of you know me at this point. My name is Tina. I work in student life as the study abroad and internship placement officer. Um, what I also hope is kind of starting to trickle out into the VCB student grapevine is that starting last semester and also this semester, Student Life has been working really hard to sort of expand our career advising um, capacity. So we've started doing workshops and seminars and individual advising sessions for students. Um, so the conversation that eventually became this panel, I guess, actually started last semester when John von Bergen and I sat down and we were talking about how the career advising needs, hi, come in, about how the career advising needs for art students is frequently very, very different than what politics or economics or philosophy students might require. So when we sort of came back to the conversation this semester, I, myself, John von Bergen, and David Terry, we all sat down and we thought, who better to actually answer all of these questions about you know, careers in the practicing arts than human beings who have had careers in the practicing arts. So that is what we have for you here today. We have six fantastic um, people, all of whom have had very successful, vibrant, and exciting careers in the arts, and they're here to tell you about their stories and their experiences, and hopefully you can um, ask some questions of them and learn a lot. So I'm just going to introduce everybody very quickly by name. Maybe you guys can just give a wave. Um, so on our panel today, we have April Gertler. Um, John Von Bergen, David Terry, Sophia New, John Kleckner, and Nina Tettenbrock. So just two quick things before I turn it over. The first is that there is a cake and juice and wine reception that will be following this. Um, it'll be outside. If you have a few more questions to ask of our panelists, that is your chance. Or if you just want free wine, that's fine too. That'll be outside. Um, the second part is if after this you think you might be interested in the BCB internship program where we actually buy you an internship that aligns with your interests and you can get academic credit for it, please either come talk to me, send me an email, drop by my office, um, always happy to talk about that program. Um, if there are no questions, great, then I will turn it over to David Terry who in addition to being a panelist is also going to be moderating the discussion today. Thanks everyone. Thank you. Uh, a little backstory. I'm happy to be here this semester teaching, but a, a little over a year ago, I was in this room giving a, uh, a, a talk as well as in my past career at the New York Foundation for the Arts. So it's kind of fun to be back here in a just different capacity with this esteemed uh, panel of accomplished artists. And what's great about these artists is they all have very different paths that they've taken to where they are now and probably will go on different paths in, in the future as well because that's just the nature of what we do. So they're all coming from various backgrounds, from uh, sculptural backgrounds, performance arts, performance theater, uh, film, photography, you name it, they've done it in some capacity, and administrative work as well, and obviously uh, academia. Um, the questions we have here will kind of run through pretty quickly for about an hour. And then we'll open the floor up for questions uh, that you may have that are referencing some of the answers that they've given you. These questions are coming from you guys, so um, they're very good and they're really interesting, and I think you're going to get some great feedback from the artist. But what I wanted to start out first with is a question that all of you answered at some point in your lives, and that I'm going to ask our panelists to answer. And that is, and you can add a little bit of where you were along the way, but um, what did you want to be when you grew up? Because <laughs> that's something everyone thought of and had to think of and had to come up with an answer, and I'll start. Um, I wanted to be a doctor. I guess that's sort of generic standard. Um, obviously, it didn't go that way. Um, and I'm happy that it didn't. Uh, but then I went to do music, and then I was going to film, and then finally landed in sculpture, and now I'm doing multidisciplinary uh, work. And eventually, I'd like to be doing more performative work, too. So. I'm just a little too nervous to do that right now, but someday, someday. Uh, but Sophia, what did you want to be when you grew up? I think I honestly didn't know. Yeah. I really had no clue. I think before I got an aeroplane, I thought it would be really great to be an air stewardess until you get on a plane and then you realise it's not much fun. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, and, and, then, and the other half of the question was where do you want to be or where are you? Or, or if, so from, from the idea of being uh, an air steward yeah. to where you are now. Were there very, any, very was there a sh short term? Or, yeah. I guess what I didn't know then that's perhaps relevant is that, you know, the precarity of artists' lives means that you have to get on planes lots. And <laughs> the fact that planes are cheap is uh, a problem for the environment, but it, only, it makes the kind of lifestyle that I lead tenable. 
So that's one weird consequence of that little story. Yeah. So originally, a uh, heavy metal drummer. <laughs> oh, well, you're kind of still living the dream, my friend. A bit, yeah. I'm still heavy awesome. metal drumming sometimes with my band. Yeah, but I think it was um, definitely through my teen years that was really more of a focus. Was yeah, in my original move to New York City as a teenager, it was also to find a band to get things moving in that direction. So it was. It took some time before things went towards visual arts. So. I think that's also true for most of us. Multiple careers, you know, managing them at the same time too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, I don't know the correct translation. I wanted to become a Seil Tänzerin, which is like a rope dancer. You know, someone who is kind of balancing on a rope oh, in a circle. Tape rope. Tape rope. Tape rope. Tape rope. Yeah. Wow. yeah, exactly. That's what, that was maybe when I was That's about like an four or five. Or so. Yeah, it's it is, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. And then I think nurse for a long time. And then afterwards, honestly, I didn't know. And then I went into a kind of more serious direction because I guess when, where I grew up, uh, becoming an artist was not really something you would do. So um, for me it was like, okay, you either become a doctor, like a medical doctor, a lawyer or a teacher. So I started studying becoming a teacher for two semesters before I went in other directions and became an artist and academic. Yeah. <laughs> Um, I actually secretly always wanted to be an artist, and I was I was sort of under the ruling thumb of my father, and so I um, didn't pursue that. So I got a heaven's first undergraduate degree in interdisciplinary studies and social sciences, and I was thinking I'm going to go the direction of becoming a journalist. That was sort of my direction, and I did that kind of. In, intensively and um, but I really just wanted to be an artist but I didn't understand even how that could <laughs> manifest and then uh, I went to visit a friend at Rhode Island School of Design and I thought oh okay now I finally can exhale because I feel comfortable with the weirdos <laughs> so that's sort of how it started mm. yeah, yeah I, comfortable with the weirdos it's kind of I have the same I always wanted to be an artist, I think. I just didn't know what, I think my idea of what an artist was wasn't so clear and changed. So for a while it was like Picasso, and then it was like, uh, well maybe I'll design graphics for a skateboard company, or maybe I'll take pictures for a magazine, or, you know, it kept changing, but some, somehow, creative visual arts. I just grew up in a kind of suburban hell <laughs> where where there was no there was no precedent. I had no I never knew an artist. I I the closest thing was I had a, a cousin who was a graphic designer but he hated his job. But uh, it wasn't until I got to maybe university that I found the weirdos and then I said, This is this is my place. These are my people. Welcome. <laughs> um, obviously, you all wear many, many hats and successfully in the art world. Can you tell us when one should take an academic career route uh, or process versus actually just practicing and going out and doing it? So it's a little bit like hands on versus like the academic route. Um, maybe John, you seem like you have. Oh, that's funny. I was looking to Nina. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, maybe she would be. I do. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, I think it's really hard to say because I, I don't think, um, I mean, I had a pretty weird zigzaggy way of getting to where I am right now, or it wasn't this, it wasn't what appeared around me um, when I was younger in terms of what appeared linear in terms of like, oh yeah, you finish your undergrad, you do an MFA, and then you kind of build things up, and I saw a lot of people doing that, I didn't actually, I decided early on not to go that route, so um, I'm actually probably the worst example, or one of the worst examples in terms of academia, even though I'm teaching here, um, because a lot of the things were, for me, focused, especially upon graduating in New York at SVA, the, the thing was really just getting into it, in terms of having a studio and having the experiences right away, in terms of showing and all the struggles and everything, in terms of dealing with the art market or dealing with, um, you know, lack of inspiration, all those things. I just wanted to kind of be inside that right away. So I wasn't continuing towards MFA. I wasn't going towards PhD and um, made a conscious decision. Um, even didn't apply for MFAs. So it was never even 
part of my agenda. So I kind of stayed on this other track, honestly. Okay. Here for me. Um, well, I basically started, as I, as I said, I started becoming a teacher, started studying becoming a teacher, which, which was like my main subjects were literature and philosophy. And I just turned or switched very quickly from, from, um, from, from having this focus on becoming a teacher, of doing a, a general magister at that time, like a master with no, you know, we don't know what's, you know, no pedagogy or didactic or any kind of these, these pedagogic um, subjects. And, but the thing was, I, you know, deep inside and secretly, I, I've always uh, been an artist in the sense that I, that I uh, practiced lots of, you know, painting, theater making, uh, music, a lot of music all my childhood and youth. And, um, but I always thought, well, if I, if I, if I, you know, this is how I grew up, you have to make a, I don't know if you have to go to art school to be an artist. So for me, that, that kind of was, not an option at that point, and um, uh, so I, I went on a, on quite an actually no, I additioned to uh, drama schools mm -hmm. around that time, so start of my of my studies, and I hated it. I hated the straight drama school. I thought this is not the kind of theatre I wanted to do. And in school, actually, there was a we had like an. Um, a kind of extracurriculum course where we it was called Kultur AG, like cultural course where we, anyone could just um, you know do the practice the kind of art he or she wanted to and at the end of the year we would put up a show and so and I thought why isn't there something like this and I didn't know anything about it so I but I continued and I really enjoyed studying and then eventually I studied theater studies as a main subject which I very much enjoyed and I think I've always been an academic in the sense that I really loved doing hu studying humanities and reading and writing and thinking was always a passion and um, but secretly there was this other world I met actually an, a, on an exchange to um, the UK, to Scotland, Glasgow. And, um, and there, there people were much more theater, or doing theatre studies also meant to do practical work, which I didn't know at all. In Germany it's always either or. And I thought, and, and this is where I started doing practical work and it became more and more professional. And, and the people I met there, I actually we met here, and then a whole kind of scene opened up to me. And this is when I I, I thought I or I realized there's another way of doing theater than, you know, going to drama school, which for me wasn't the right thing. And so I always did both. And people always said you have to decide at one point if you want to make a, a real career, you have to decide. And I'm very happy I didn't because. It's both my passion and the combination of it. it it's my thing. <laughs> so, yeah. So, there's okay, no. She's talking about performance okay. too, and how does that vibe with what uh, your experience is? Yeah, similar. I guess one of the things that's a bit different is that I decided after my MA, um, I was teaching on a course on a BA pretty much instantly, literally three months after graduating from my MA. And that was like people that were a few years younger than me, and I suddenly thought, oh, minute, this is really weird. I haven't really had enough experience. So I made a conscious decision not to do that for 10 years. So I didn't teach at all for 10 years and really just wanted to practice. And then I thought, well, then you'd have something to share, you know. Mm -hmm. And that really helped me personally because I felt like I had to throw myself into it as much as possible. And there was something a little bit awkward about not having enough time to really digest what it is that you've learned. Yeah, that's a good point. Mm -hmm. John or April? You go ahead. Uh, I'm, so the question is, like, when should you stay in the educational environment learning and versus when should you get out in the world and or if you think it. one needs to if it's even necessary you know, an mm. academic per route versus yeah direct uh, approach, say. you know it's hard to sort of speak it's hard to speak generally about this because it's so individualized based on what it is that you want to do mm -hmm. so if any of these people in this room came to me and said here's what I make here's what I do what should I do I would have probably different advice, but I think certainly being in this kind of barred or in an educational environment offers you opportunities for like sometimes you have resources like uh, dark rooms or dance theaters. I mean, th 
certain resources that are hard to come by on your own. And I think you're definitely around interesting people to, you know, I mean, I think no artist is an island in that sense. So if you can get as much as you can out of the educational experience and then dive right in. I mean, I think basically people, if you were to try to enter the, I mean, the, the world that I'm swimming in of like painters and galleries and institutions, yeah, you need to get a little training, but then you need to hurry up and get to work and get involved in the so I, I don't know. I, I personally, my higher education ended at a BFA, and kind of maybe similar to John, I I didn't even. No, that's not true. I did, I applied for an MFA program, but I found myself starting to exhibit when I was receiving my kind of decisions for the MFA, and I thought, wow, I got into this group show. But that's what I wanted to go to get an MFA for, was to sort of build my work up and build my confidence. I thought, well, maybe I'll just wait on this, and I'll try the group show. And then once I started doing that, it, it kind of quickly led right to the practice part, and I postponed the education. And a different question would be, do I regret that decision now? But I mean, that's a whole other... Footnote. Yeah, footnote. Yeah, footnote. Um, I, I think it's interesting hearing everybody's answers, and this is what we were joking about outside. How did you all do it? <laughs> but um, one thing that no one's mentioned, and I, I want to mention it because I, I, I want to be honest about this, that for me, um, going this academic route also has to do with my financial being in the world. Mm -hmm. And um, I think a lot of people, um, unlike you, a lot of people choose academia partly because you're in this art world and you are connected to the art world, but you also um, need to make a living. And if you're not represented by a gallery, and if you're not showing your work in a gallery setting and you're not part of that point, is it 0.01% <laughs> who um, are in that world, then you need to kind of sustain your life in another way. Um, I, I did, I ended up, going to art school after I had my BFA and a uh, BA and then um, I ended up going to Bard actually got my MFA at Bard and during that time something really important for me personally happened which was I did an exchange in Germany at the Städelschule in Frankfurt and that actually changed everything for me because it made me realize that I really did want to focus on my, making my work for a while kind of similar to what you were saying and in this idea of I was suddenly exposed to this very, for me, was a very non-traditional approach and exploration of what was possible as an artist. Um, and that was really life-changing for me. And I went back, I finished my MFA, but then I came back to Germany and have been there, been here since that time. But it took me 13 years of living in Germany to now be teaching here. So it was a long, but yeah, there's other meandering paths that I'll mention later. No, you made me think of two things, and you too, uh, John, when he pulls out about the financial need. And I was thinking about, well, could one even afford to go to a graduate program? This is after a Because I'm still paying for mine. Oh, me too. Um, yeah, yeah, it will be for a oh, long time yeah. now. Oh, yeah. uh, and then uh, with John about whether or not he regret, regretted going or not, I went to an MFA program pretty much right after mm -hmm. graduate school. But then I was kind of in this mindset, brainwashed mindset, that that's the path that you have to go yeah. for success. And then yeah. you have to get an MFA if you're going to teach and if you're going to get jobs and all that stuff. And it couldn't be, you know, I've been spending the last 15 years like undoing that in a way and just being open and receptive to other opportunities and, and other career paths that, that can supplement and support and energize your practice as well. And I, and but... Interestingly, I didn't get that until I was in graduate school on a work study to have to pay for my graduate school mm -hmm. when I started to do administrative work uh, and then curatorial work, which led to you know being um, uh, you know the other half of my art career basically. So that opportunity came from that. So it's this weird kind of cycle yeah. that like <laughs> chicken egg kind of thing that happens continuously. But work comes from work. I mean, experience right. comes from experience, Exposure and from I think that's yeah. really important. Yeah. 
thing to yeah. mention. No, I think you're absolutely right. Yeah. Um, and this is a question maybe you guys have asked yourselves um, at some point in time. Um, how do you, or how could one translate from, I make art to, I am an artist? Is there ever a cutoff for when one can choose to become an artist? Can you lead one artistically unrelated life and then drop it to pursue art? If so, when is that uh, cutoff point? And that's like a five part question, so feel free to answer any bits you'd like to, to choose and I'll open to anyone who'd like to begin. Can I, yeah. you know, when I looked at this question, I thought this is a brilliant question in a way and it actually it really made me think about how incredibly abstract the concept of an artist is sometimes within an art community, but especially outside of an art community because 99% of the world, if I meet 99% of the world outside of the art world and they say, what do, you, what do you do? I say, I'm a sculptor. They're like, oh, so you chisel figures. Like That is the immediate impression that one has of a sculptor, which is so far from the, of what you, when you see sculpture production in 2018. You know? I mean, that's part of it, of course. There's people still doing that. But it's amazing the stereotype that's out there mm -hmm. connected to that. And it also makes me really think, too, in terms of... Um, this concept of the artist, which I mean, I'm super curious to hear other opinions of this, because these days I've thought about it as well more as a lifestyle, perhaps, than a career, mm -hmm. because the stereotypes of careers very often don't apply mm -hmm. to what artists sure. do. Sure, sure. We're in a different economy. We're dealing with completely different logistics, which is one of the reasons why I was very happy to see this thing form as a group, because it's so hard to, to even say, yeah, this is how it works. And, all the stereotypes that I heard my whole life, I found them discounted and refuted on more than one occasion concerning what we do. So in a way, I guess thinking back to the question, you know, being an artist, you know, calling myself an artist very often, I see it more these days as a lifestyle that's certainly my profession is part of it, but I, I form more of a sense that's like bigger than the profession. And I like, I'm more comfortable with that, at least personally. I'm more comfortable thinking of this thing that's beyond the profession. It's interesting what you say in terms of, uh, because I think in terms of theater, it's even more complicated. You know, every year I have to fill out this form from the Künstler Sozialkasse, it's the yeah. artist uh, yeah, social um, insurance. Mm -hmm. And you have to say what kind of artist you are. And the kind of artist I am is just not on this form. And there is a section calling, called performing arts. And I'm not a director, even though I do direct. I'm not, a, I'm not a, uh, an actress or an actor, even though I do act or perform on stage. I'm not a dramaturg, even though I do dramaturgical work. I'm not a theater writer, even though I write for my own pieces. I can't really tell what I am, so I always tick this extra box of some uh, other fields in the performing arts area or something. It's really, um, and I, th I find it very interesting, what is it actually to be an artist these days? And lifestyle, yes, I, I, would, uh, I, I, I would agree to a certain, uh, certain extent, but I really think, oh, in my view, it's something that that it's it's a, I don't know maybe it that doesn't apply for 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 just nowadays I think it's a general or I see it less than a craft than something that a, a certain stance toward the towards the world a certain kind mm. of posing questions and or questioning the the um, it's a very philosophical stance somehow but of course we use certain techniques we have m might you know be very good in in questioning the world through painting or questioning the world through performing or um, somehow taking not taking for granted what we what we and how we live but questioning it's a, it's a critical practice really and it can apply to any kind of technique or you know artistic means that you use um, maybe but but the, to come back to your question what's what when do you Swi switch from making art into being an artist. I think uh, for, for me personally there was a point where I decided to, as I said, I always felt somehow artistic or like an artist, but I, there was a, because my environment I grew up in was so not encouraging me to make art, it, for me it took an extra courage, it took an extra uh, or an inspiration from the outside, from from in a, you know moving to big cities, l watching lots of shows, and going to exhibitions, and it it took this um, 
a, um, a, f a flame that's uh, <laughs> that uh, lights it or something something that 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 made me feel or give me the courage to actually do it and yeah because and also against the the expectations of you know my family and all that sure yeah <laughs> I, I have to just echo what these two have said I totally agree I think it's very much um, about a critical practice and a lifestyle for sure but I um, I remember being very challenged by this question when I was in art school and coming towards graduating and feeling like oh so I'm gonna get my degree and that just means I'm an artist now I'm an artist oh great yeah I'm an artist yeah, really. and I was really You're a master <laughs> <laughs> so this is undergrad with okay. BFA and I just could not kind of wrap my mind around that idea that who decides that it's all so subjective. Every part of this, every layer of this is subjective. And I think it took me a long time to kind of settle in and kind of find my own footing and understand what it meant for me. And, what, what, and then also looking at other people who were practicing artists and realizing, but I'm not that type of artist and I'm not that type of artist either. And kind of embracing my like you have, embracing your sort of curatorial administrative side of your life as being also part of your practice and understanding, okay, but it's taken such a long time to evolve into that understanding of, s of self as an artist. So I think it's super, per excuse me, super personal question, actually. Yeah, I don't know. I was wondering about the cutoff thing. Was that to do with age? No, no, really just any point, career or, okay. yeah. Or could be age, or an age of society, unfortunately. I personally get really inspired about hearing artists that started to do really well when they were really old. Mm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you think about the Louise Bourgeois, oh, and yeah. you think about yeah. think, wow, that's so fantastic. Even though they probably had a life of pure frustration and annoyance, um, it's just great to hear that, you know, you, I mean, I think probably none of us imagine retiring, right? Well, I was just literally <laughs> thinking the same thing, but I have a career that I would never want to retire from. Exactly, exactly. I would not yeah. want to retire. So, you know, if you start to earn money in your 60s and you suddenly get a gallery then, even though everybody tells you such a thing is not possible, there are always precedents of people that have done it. So you think, mm -hmm. oh, well, maybe you can't. Maybe it'll The story's happy when it ends well, yeah. but mm -hmm. for a lot of people, there's so many cases where it doesn't end well. That's true. I, I, I just want to <laughs> learn some other skills. Yeah. <laughs> but I, I yeah. understood this question like like changing careers at some point. Like if I, if I, you know, like William Carlos Williams, you know, was a doctor and then now I think he's probably more widely known as a poet than his doctoring. But, uh, you know, I mean, there's a case like Philip Glass, you know, was like a plumber and a taxi driver into his 40s before he had enough money to to be a full-time composer. He was but an art assistant for Richard Serra, too, at one point. He was, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, um, and I think, I mean, something weird, ha something weird happened in my own life where as I, I mean, these things like I call myself a painter or an artist, but it's really kind of a shorthand based on whatever context I'm moving in, like what you were saying about sculptor. It's like, if I say painter to my grandparents, they would say like, oh, you needed a degree to paint a house? But uh, I, I, I mean, the idea of what I was chasing after had nothing to do with this kind of, the word career was exactly what I was not interested in, you know, or like the professionalization of art, especially contemporary art and visual art, it's like, I was exactly interested in the weirdos and I was like I did it because it would piss my parents off and like <laughs> it was what all of my friends were going to study safe things and not safe things but you know I was and I, I, I a safe route. yeah I mean I thought like I mean I have a bit of a kind of contrarian streak where I just wanted to anger some people and then like I thought this was it was just really interesting I mean I was, I was sort of rebelling against the the boredom really and I thought that art was just forever interesting I mean you could always no matter how boring art got like when you were making it or if it was bad it was still you could find some cool thing you know there was always something interesting and yeah, I never thought about 
I mean, I think saying you're an artist or, or these things, it's sort of the career side of it never, like the yeah. professional side. But, but now I find myself, you know, in the middle of this being like, you know, I should really get more professional when I organize my studio visits or at least, you know, like I, it's now I have to, the responsibility of life and going forward with this and doing this professionally was never what I imagined in the beginning. But Well, I think I, maybe a little different for me, but there was definitely a, a naive sense for me. It's like, yeah, you become an artist and then this happens, these steps, you go through these steps and there you are. I remember one point being in my studio saying, this is exactly what I'm supposed to be doing right here, right now, carving stone because I'm a sculptor, that's what I'm supposed to be doing. And it could be further from that concept right now, but you're always having to kind of re-identify yourself or subjectively one is often trying to re-identify themselves. And now I wouldn't necessarily call myself a sculptor even though that's what my, my mastery is um, <laughs> because that's not all that I do. It's not all that I want to do and it also harkens to that specific type of work. I call myself an artist because, like you were saying, it's a lifestyle, but it's also, I think it's a mode of consciousness. Mm -hmm. And it's just the way you approach things, the way you think about things from that kind of perspective. When I was here two summers ago doing a residency with the Node Center for Curatorial Studies, we did this project on um, could you do art training? Could you train someone to be an artist? And what is that like? And through workshops, uh, you know, divergent thinking, and are these kind of things, a kaleidoscopic viewpoint, looking at things from other perspectives, is that what makes an artist? And we kind of did research on that. Could you even train that? And kind of not. Um, it's just some of the research. I, mean, I think a lot of it is, yeah, and, and in some ways you can, but in a lot of ways, you know, you can't. I think it's some of it is just in, in your nature as well. Um, and then again, navigating that and, and putting that into practicality. But uh, this yeah. phrase you said, mode of consciousness, I mean, that's really what, it, what I relate to. I mean, the whole idea of like, am I an artist? Am I a sculptor, performer? All these things, it's like some kind of question of approval from some, someone that yeah. says, I'm an artist. Yes, you there, you know, you filled out the Casca. You're, you are, <laughs> 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 you are, we approve. It's like the sort of, you're asking for permission to be accepted yeah. by the elders of art or somewhere, you know, but it's really a kind of, it's just a mode of consciousness. You just say, yeah. I mean, I, I understand that impulse to say like, oh, I'm a sculptor. I should be working with this. You know, I, now I'm really doing the sculptor thing, but I think, and then, but there's a lot of that, that also happens oh, totally. too. Because yeah. then you yeah. go to galleries or shows, and you're with peers, like, what's going on? But that's oh, not making this and doing this and like, yeah, it's not the yeah. point. It's like I'm just like someone's going to take away your art card, for, right? For, for, yeah, you know, like yeah. no, you, exactly. you are not allowed to call yourself <laughs> this. Yeah, but that's what I wanted to advocate for everybody or anybody. Like, if you think that you want to make art, then really just adopt the phrase "fake it till you make it." Like, just keep saying it <laughs> again and again and again, and keep doing it until you actually believe it. Because there's so much doubt and insecurity. Yeah. Field that we're in, that you might as well try it like that. Because I think yeah. even if even when you hear that kind of doubt in your voice when someone says, What do you do? and you practice saying it, I'm an artist. <laughs> even when there's that kind of doubt there, you should just keep I could not agree with you more than that because they don't know otherwise. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Um, the next question, I, I don't think we need to really kind of go in depth, but it was about um, whether or not you need to be professionally trained to become an artist. Can someone be a successful practicing artist on their own? I think the answer is yes, of course. There's, there's training that you could do to gain other skills and other opportunities potentially, but it, it's not a requirement, um, I believe. When I finished studies, I worked for a painter who, um, he didn't have an under, he never finished his undergrad. He had studied, uh, I think, both in New York and in L.A., and he, he never got his B.A., and the paintings he was working on, they went for six figures. They were, like, selling for $100,000, $150,000, and not to say that that's, you know, that you, that that's some formula also for the, for entering the art market, or, you know, that he was that much of an anomaly. I wouldn't say that that's the case, I and mean, I'm just bringing that up because, it was really a confrontational moment for me to see, too, that, wow, I mean, it's not all about your education and the context of your education in terms of becoming successful. I mean, he was reading philosophy, he was publishing, he was absolutely engaged in the same activities that could be connected to a, um, a continued education or, or whether master's or, or, or PhD. But having, having said that, he still figured out a way to make a painting that hadn't been made before. Mm -hmm. That was it. It was really thinking about making a contribution and having something to say at the right place, at the right time, to the right people, and having the confidence to do it again and again. Um, I was very aware of him 
going in this route, and it was actually quite inspiring for me at that time as well, because it really made me think as well, too, that your context and how you can dive deep into something in your studio and then step out and understand what this thing is in the bigger picture. This was really important for me, and it also allowed me to, um, I guess, personally uh, consider how this thing can move forward outside of this context of you know, definition of artist or where you studied and all these other things. It's like how relevant is what you're making and what you have to say. Absolutely. Yeah. And I was very, yeah, I was very kind of aware of that, I guess, at that time. Any other thoughts on that? I, I want to say something about, um, maybe people have heard this phrase, like, outsider artists. Yeah. You know? But to me... It's not autodidactic. It's like, but uh, auto I got, it's like, it's just hard. someone who's making something or doing something yeah. that never applied for an art card. <laughs> <laughs> they don't speak the... They don't the speak language. the yeah. art language. Yeah. They don't, yeah. they don't the use the codes that this establishment exactly. has used. Yeah. But I also yeah. have a problem with people who I, I know a few painters who like wear it like a badge. This autodidactic. But it's like they're, a little novelty aspect too, yeah. to some collectors Which, and gallerists, you know. But I, I mean, I think like either way, everyone's kind of self-taught. I mean. There's no program that I went through that like produced a me. I mean, it's in in that in that literal sense. I mean, that's I. Your parents. Okay. That's, oh, very good. Friend. Okay. Well, but the idea is that you know you pick up the skills you need to know and you pick up through your very life experience. So yeah. everyone's kind of autodidactic and outsider is probably where some of the most interesting art gets made because they're not playing by the rules that they're not they're not using the language and you know and the moment that things get a little too codified or safe or sterile here in the art world then everyone looks to the outsider art world but it's you know anyway I just want to bring that because there's a lot of talk of uh, insider or outsider yeah. stuff in I guess. at least in, in my circles um, moving on networking and your own personal network how do you reach out to uh, your network for support? How did you build up your network? And uh, do you feel worthy of your network? I think is, is was part of the question too. You know, where do you where do you lie in your own network? And this could be within uh, your peers. This could be within uh, who make the same type of work you do, or who do other types of work. So even in the practical sense, how does one even get that rolling? what you said before like work comes from work or experience comes from experience and it kind of happens when you do stuff mm -hmm. and when you when you're interested in stuff and you 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 go and see stuff and you you meet people you um, get inspired by or you start working with or I mean for, for my field performance or theater is a very collaborative Art practice, so you 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 have to I don't know engage with people all the time anyway, and it seems like um, so there's this side of it. So lots of the of the colleagues that I have, like Sophia, they're also my friends, <laughs> and it's then there's a fine line. Also, when you collaborate, you become very quickly you become friends, and and sometimes that can be a problem, but most of the time it's really ins it works, so it's really inspiring and. Um, so this, there's this, this one side, but of course there's the side of, you know, having to get, m applying for money, have, having to um, ask for uh, um, 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 uh, co-funding or um, co-production -pro money and meeting with uh, curators, artistic directors from venues and uh, there's this other side of, you know, engaging in this, in this field, which uh, of course really demands an effort and uh, is, is sometimes very, can be very hard and time consuming and nerve wracking. <laughs> well, it, you make and a really excellent point because not everyone necessarily has that personality to go out yeah. there and put themselves out there and, you know, networking <coughs> is very challenging, very challenging for a lot of people. Mm -hmm. um, if yeah. you're saying that. No, I totally agree with you. I mean, I couldn't, I can't emphasize that enough from what you said. Going out and seeing things yeah. and being part of things and also creating your own things. I mean, that's the route I've taken. And I think, and also asking questions of other people and, and asking 
to uh, see what other people are doing and just engaging in general. I think that's how networks start and form. And, but it's just be, being interested in what other people are doing as well and because it also fuels you and it gives you, yeah. it gives you a sense of understanding of kind of what's going on out there. And I think, it's, I think it's important also to get a fresh view outside of your studio space, outside of your head, outside of your computer screen, whatever, however your practice manifests in your space and just meet people. But it's very hard. I, I find it extremely hard. And it's hard to show up all the time. But, I, but it, who was the person who said showing up is like half the... Oh, right. yeah. <laughs> but are there any sort of <laughs> mechanisms by which that can make networks or make that effort a little simpler? I don't know if there's like online networks or any... Get an MFA. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Actually, being in Berlin for me personally yeah. was mm -hmm. a huge relief after the New York art scene. Yeah. Oh, no offense yeah. to New York. I mean, you know, I love New York. Yeah, I love visiting. <laughs> um, but no, I think uh, I found things to be uh, at times really. Um, I couldn't connect so easily with a lot of what was going on in New York, even though I'm super inspired by a lot of things there, and I also have a lot of um, friends and admiration for what's going on there. Definitely. Yeah. Um, it's a powerhouse city for art. But when I came to Berlin, it was amazing to me that regardless of the status one was at with their career or what the situation was, walking to, to a gallery, it was so much more open. Definitely. It was so much more relaxed. And this just made it easier for me to relax and to connect with people. Do you know what I mean? Like, yeah. it's just somehow, I didn't understand the codes as easily in New York, even though I had studied there and I was, you know, had lot of friends and I was showing and sometimes selling as well but um, here it was another world it was another community which made it much easier on that front. Mm -hmm. Sophia and John are both expats as well and developing yeah, networks I mean, here. I found some Berlin was quite a um, sanctuary from I was briefly in New York and before that Los Angeles and I, uh, I don't know if that Berlin still exists it's that was 10 years ago. It's different now. Mm -hmm. I don't know how open, I mean, you you do so much here that you're seeing and involved in so much more. Maybe you have a better sense of how it's changed. I think it's, I think it's still open. Yeah, I, mean, yeah, I, mean, I think it is. Feeling, I, but yeah. there's, there's more art scenes than when I got here. Yeah, for sure. There's, there's more art scenes. Yeah. So I think, different art I think scenes, the particular exactly. art scene that I was swimming in was like, it's get, it has gotten more professional and more austere and whatever. I, I just thought this, the part of this question where it said, what was it, do you deserve your network? Or oh, yeah. you, that really yeah, are you worthy of how yeah, to yeah, make I yourself Now I have another network. thing to worry about. Yeah. Like, yeah, if, yeah, I, if, I, if, I, if I'm letting my friends down, um, yeah. you're out of the network. <laughs> I, but, I, but I've never heard it, there's so much talk about networking and building network, but then yeah. this idea of, am I letting, Am I worthy of my network? <laughs> That's really fascinating. I have no idea. Uh, a, yeah, I but I, your students. Yeah. Okay. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> um, you, want to, I, you want to say yes, right? Of course, I want to say. I mean, I. But I. But I'm actually thinking work. about. But it makes you think more yeah. deeply about how, how you, you engage. Yes, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. By participating, but but then but then I think so much about, like okay, I'm worthy by showing up at my friend's stuff, and then I hope they show up at my stuff, yeah. and, but then I have to have some stuff to do, you know, <laughs> like, what if I'm in a kind of dry spell, and I've got no show, I'm not really contributing, so then now there's like a pressure of, bring some wine. But networks don't work like that, you know, I mean, they're weird, it's like I have friendships, and we support each other, and we talk, and then I have networks of like acquaintances, but, Ah, that's a, I'm, I'm really, that's kind of, <laughs> short circuit. now I'm, <laughs> yeah, but it's so interesting, like, are you worthy of your network? Are you, I just canceled Facebook. So. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I totally agree, the next thing I was going to say is that maybe, you know, just notice that we're of a certain generation, and maybe yeah. the next generation is going to deal with the network question in a completely yeah. different yeah. way, mm. and mm -hmm. I think it probably is already happening, and yeah. because I'm somebody that doesn't partake in social networks, I'm always surprised of the human memory when people come back to you sort of, I don't know, 15 years later and remind you that I saw you in this context, in this place, I remember what it is that you do, would you like to do this now? 
and you're always like, whoa. And again, in this question of like, I haven't really actually looked after that relationship for a long time. We've not been in the same city, and that's kind of really nice to realise that these personal connections yeah. that you make through meeting people all the time, actually they, you know, they sort of linger with people, and I th that as well. So as whatever kind of you did had a worth that maintained that yeah. connection in, in a and sense the sense that. You left an imprint that, I mean, maybe the worthy part is just like it's more profound and mysterious than I'm make, than <laughs> making, you know, contributing in a, mm. I made a show, everyone, that's my offer. Right. But it's about being curious, isn't it? About being constantly yeah. curious about what other people are doing, what are the other contexts. And I mean, one of the tricky things about Berlin is it's a very transient place. So even to keep up with, like, mm. what is everybody doing? Where are they? It's much, much, much more international in the last 20 years. And, yeah. it, it, that, and you really feel that in a fantastic way. Um, but the transient, like so many artists being based in, makes it very high competition which is another big topic. It's interesting it doesn't come up in the kind of set of questions, but it's a tricky thing, you know, perhaps competition and rejection, the questions that come down the bottom of the wall. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, yeah. right <laughs> but, you know, I think that's, that's a real thing to contend with. Yeah. But you, you mentioned uh, New York and, and the scenes and, and scenes that are really vast. I think there are other ways that you could get into networks, and those could be through institutions, like BART could be one, certainly. I was fortunate uh, in New York because it's vast, if you will. Uh, to work in an institution where artists were constantly kind of coming in and applying, and I was had had access to thousands and thousands of artists and their work, and uh, was able to develop good friendships that way. So, and I never went to openings and things like that because I was kind of the scene was kind of grotesque to me. So I was happy to have a more community scene or community environment to kind of get into make those connections. So there are definitely institutional venues, and then. Um, you brought up the uh, about proximity and, and community being in Berlin and versus New York, and that was another question, which is a good segue. Um, is proximity important to where you are in your career? Is it important to physically be somewhere closer? So, for example, if we're talking about New York, would it make sense to be in Philadelphia? It's less expensive, but also access to New York. If it's if it's Berlin or another city, is it better to be closer? Like, how much does proximity play? Uh, into career success, do you think? I would say probably it also has to do with the context that you could, the home base that you can create for yourself, mm -hmm. which might not be so easy in the beginning, of course. I mean, I knew very few people when I moved here. Um, but I think also um, for their generation, it could be quite different than ours. And just thinking about social media and also the opportunities that totally. are amplified these days that were definitely not available when I was in my 20s, for instance. I was just like, there was nothing like that. Um, and so I guess in a way that that question could be really changing depending on generation for, you know, perhaps, even though of course these are tools that we could still be taking, um, uh, making use of or taking advantage of. But um, for the most part, I don't, I'm not so sure that, um, yeah, I don't know, I'll think about that a little bit more. But I think yeah, maybe someone else has an idea. Well, I think Berlin is a really odd example. There's not many cities in Europe where the capital city is cheaper than most other places. So it's cheaper than Hamburg, it's cheaper than Munich, it's cheaper than Frankfurt. So that's quite an unusual thing. But I wouldn't advocate, I mean, unless you have a very certain personality, you could get a huge, cheap studio in Brandenburg, but I wouldn't advocate moving to Brandenburg. Mm. For all sorts of political reasons. So, you know, I think proximity and that kind of thing makes a difference. I, um, I mean, I first of all, I had, as I said earlier, I had to move away from Berlin. For me, it was the opposite. I had to move away from Berlin, which for me was like, you know, studying at the university, big courses, reading, writing, and to, to for me to start doing art, uh, my artwork, I had to leave Berlin. So maybe it also has to do with going away and ha changing your perspective and mm -hmm. you feel much more, I don't know, open to things and uh, so it's, for me, it was really the going going somewhere else and changing the environment. So, mm -hmm. but that, so that was the starting point, but then and nowadays I really find it important to be in this city because this is where, yeah, the the, the work's happening and this is where I get the money. I, um, the, the work that I do is, is, is mostly um, based on public funding and I can't get it anywhere else really. And um, so I am bound to the city and I'm happy to be. <laughs> so but it wouldn't necessarily be your preference though, if there was funding elsewhere think, for your creative. Uh, yes, I think I would love to change. Yeah. yeah. 
yeah, I would love to move so, uh, somewhere where it's definitely warmer <laughs> and maybe keep Berlin as a basis. But uh, but uh, yes, I'd love to be to live somewhere else for a while. I could imagine that. <laughs> but just because it's been for a long time now. So right. Right. Yeah. We're yeah. that here. <laughs> so mistake. I, think we're I, I think uh I well I, I was wondering um if proximity also has to do with I mean I agree with your points about social media. I think that's really important. But I, I wonder too about kind of what where in the art world you find yourself. It might be more important to be in a big city because of social funding, but if you're I, it depends on your. I think it depends on you and your practice and what you're looking for and what you're hoping to achieve with your practice and with the direction that you have. Um, personally, my practice has become much more social practices oriented, and I think because of that, it's very important for me to be in a city, be in not any city, this city, Berlin. Um, but uh, I think I think there's also this kind of element of really needing to have time and space to be able to make your, make your work. And there are so many unaffordable cities out there in the world, and it's really tough. I, I don't know how young people do it in New York City. I, I don't <laughs> understand. It seems impossible. Plus funds, I guess. <laughs> I don't know. It seems really tough. So I, it happens. People, I mean, there's, yeah. I know a lot of young artists in New York, and they make it work. It's a hustle, of course. It's a them. massive mm -hmm. hustle. Yeah. 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 So I'm not sure. Yeah, I mean, I, it's not so different. I expand on April's point of view. Is, like I say, if you want to come ask me how to do what I, what I have experience doing, I'm happy to customize my <laughs> advice for it. But it's really, a, it's so particular to the, to the person, yeah. to what they want. I, I think the most the most valuable advice is just to have a clear idea, as clear as possible, what you where you want to go with this. Like, pick a role model and say how did they do it, and then you know learn from that path. But you got to be careful with that too. No, you have to be that careful. Mean, but and and I think that picking a role model or not even that's maybe a bad but but just say like. I want to, like for me, I, I, I make paintings, I want to show them in galleries. So there's like a goal, and it's like, how do best, you know, what kind of galleries, where, who sees it, all this stuff gets sorted out, but I think choosing a clear goal, and that may change, you know, you have a couple of shows and you realize, oh, I hate this, I want to do something more social practice based, and uh, being flexible, but I think it's very important to have a target, have a goal to, to, to work towards something concrete rather than just, I'm going to go to New York and see what happens. But that's a lot of people do that. Or I'm going to come to Berlin because it's cheap and fun. And maybe you're at a, maybe that's, if that's where you or if someone is in their life, they just want to be a sponge for a bit and go somewhere and take it all in and then sort it out later, that's fine. Berlin's great for that or wherever cheap Philly or... Right. Who knows? I mean, I would go further east and go to some, explore some new territory, Eastern Europe, and you know, the new Berlin. Right. Thing, but right. yeah, I, I could only be more specific if I had like the, the, the all the details in front of me. But you mentioned something I'm picking up and tying into the next question was picking a role model, and oftentimes mm -hmm. people have role models. Uh, at least in the artist world, they're usually other artists or elder artists. And oftentimes their goal is to work with them as an assistant uh, to gain some of that knowledge and expertise. And um, I'd like to find out from you guys, and I don't know if you ever have been an artist assistant, but what do you believe are the benefits in becoming an artist assistant? Is it necessary? And who does it truly serve? I would have liked to have been your assistant. Your, the, the job you, you had, still I, would, from I could still... <laughs> <laughs> no, the assistant job that you had, I would have... Uh, Oh yeah, all right. He likes the painter I used to work for. Uh, okay. Yeah, that's what he was trying to say. Um, <laughs> I think it's uh, maybe I just jump in, but I think it's super helpful, uh, like uh, to learn some skill. I mean, I think there's probably in my my experience, I certainly got way more out of uh, working for artists in terms of concrete, practical 
experience and advice and, and how to do things than I ever did from school. I, I have to agree you know, to the sense that there were questions and answers that um, were much more direct and easier to get to um, completely independent of what I got. Questions of your own. Uh, or, or how really things work. Questions of yeah. How things answer. work with the art world. I mean, it's a real mystery um, for a lot of us when we're studying because, of course, there's so many things that come up that are not part of your education in places like here or, you know, wherever we study. It's just, so, it's a whole other education as far as I'm concerned. If you want to, for instance, enter the art market, if you want to be part of something, and this doesn't have to be the art market, I'm sure this expands into anything of a creative field. I believe that the education would probably be best to start as soon as you know you want to go for that, and it's going to continue after you get your degree. It's not going to just be, it's not going to be that, you know, you get your degree and boom, you're necessarily So was it your intent to work with an assistant that could impart certain knowledge, um, career knowledge, and practical professional knowledge as well, or was that sort of a benefit? It was a combination. Or did you come in with like, I want to be your assistant, but I'd like to learn these things? No, the opportunity fell in my lap. It was my next door neighbor who was a famous painter. I didn't realize that until I was in an art history class and they started talking about him. I was like, are you kidding me? I was like, yeah. <laughs> and so it was serendipity, honestly, that I got to know this guy and he was, you know, just as I was, uh, just after I got my degree, I was walking down the street in Soho and he was going to set up his show and, and the opportunity was like, oh yeah, I might be needing some help. And then I worked for him for quite a while. To the question though, I think um, to a degree, I, I don't know if it's really that healthy for a long period of time to work for someone else because also all the people you get to know in his world or her world, they know you as the assistant of that person. And that's not, and that st it's not always the case, but very often I think it's an obstacle for them to really kind of embrace you and actually get curious about what you do depends. and what you're about. It depends. It depends. some artists who are, who look at, I mean, not name names, but there are some artists who like prep their assistant to later than join the gallery that they're, you know, sort of... That happens too, yeah, yeah. But it also depends if you're working in the, in the nature of how they're working, of course, if you can be a protege of theirs, you know. Protege, that's a good point. Yeah, I mean, in a way, if you're not, if you're clearly not, it might just be another kind of relationship or yeah. situation. Mm -hmm. I think it, it really depends what, what does that imply to be an assistant. For example, I assisted a lot with, with the group Gob Squad, and with, with which I later became a performer. And it kind of grew naturally because being an assistant for them, actually I had no idea what that actually means to be a, an assistant in a theater production. They asked me after a workshop if I had time to assist a little bit here and there. And of course I did some, you know, oh, we, we, need, we need batteries for the camera, can you go and get them? And, uh, but otherwise I was just part of the rehearsal process and I was part of being the artistic process. So they, they let me be a co-creator of the work. And that, that was so inspiring and, for, and, and I think if I had actually known what it actually means like in the state theater to be an assistant, I wouldn't have, you know, maybe be, had enough courage to raise my voice. <laughs> and so it just was naturally, and because it, they work as a collective, so I, 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 I was invited to take part. And it really depends, but I also agree, I remember when after my degree in the university uh, in theater studies and literature, I was asked by um, Chicago based, at that time doesn't exist anymore, company Go at Island to be their uh, tour manager. Uh, so to do this kind of assisting work and and I realized very quickly um, I said no str pretty straight away uh, because I realized I don't want to be put in that box because there are a lot of you know people who graduate from theater studies at that time who were going into organizational administrative work working for companies and managing them and and I realized it's not my, my path. I, I want to do art. I want to, I want to actually be the, the people who do the work who was put on stage. I want to be on stage, but I don't want to manage the tour of, the, of it. And so th this was a point where I said, no, this is, gonna, this is a totally, this is not my world. This is not my job. And I, even though I would have to do on the side with you know, artworks or people doing art, I, this is this is not uh, my direction. So I think there's a point where you have to be honest to yourself and ask yourself, you know, to is it is it is it something where you can get inspired by, or is it something where you 
I don't know, serve other people and you feel like, oh no, I, I it takes away the time and energy mm. from me to mm. actually um, do and in, work work that's uh, that inspires you and that you actually want to do. Mm. Yeah. That's a good point. Mm. Okay. I think I can say something perhaps from the other side. Yeah. Thinking about um, the responsibility of having to delegate to having uh, interns. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I never wanted to have an intern, and I was always found it a bit cheeky when I spoke to some other kind of uh, collaborative groups when they'd say, oh yeah, we wouldn't function unless we had eight or nine interns. And I also found it a very exploitative kind of environment and was very wary of it. Sure. But Stanford have this fantastic deal in, in Berlin where they, um, through the Crook Foundation, actually pay their interns so well, I think most of the time they were being paid more than we were earning. Wow. <laughs> so um, that was a, then an added responsibility of not only have I got to kind of give them worthwhile work, um, but I've got to keep them engaged. Um, you know, if you set a task, but they would sometimes do something that I would think would be a couple of days' work, and within a couple of hours, they'd done it, and be like, oh, okay. So learning <laughs> constantly of like, what's, what can you delegate? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, how do you delegate? What's kind of interesting, meaningful work to, to share and give to somebody else? Um, but the other last point I wanted to make about the difference in the German education system, which is not going to happen here, but it's just perhaps interesting to know that within the fine art world in Germany, you sort of study under somebody. So you study under Rebecca Horn or Valley Export, and, and that really has a kudos of you for a kind of art career quite a lot, because it's a bit of a name-dropping kind of thing to do. But I also find that super problematic as well, because I got the impression from people that had done that, it was a bit like a kind of mini-me situation. If you started to make work like them, yeah. They yeah. Were, then you did very well. But if you didn't, they were a bit, you were a bit kind of pushed aside, and I found that super problematic. Mm -hmm. It's also on the CVs here. It's much yeah. more common yeah. than the so American CVs. That was right. the biggest yeah. thing yeah. I noticed. Yeah. 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 yeah, you have that on your CV that it's you study under, under such and such. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Badge of honor. Mm -hmm. yeah. So um, next, I want to talk about residencies. Uh, you all have maybe participated in, in them. Some of you have created them, uh, and I want to know if, if uh, or the question was, do you need to adjust your work or themes uh, to be? participant in a residency, or are they only to build your practice or network? Should they be exclusive to one another, and are they worth it? Um, from the back end, I'd like, yeah, April, if you don't mind starting off. Sure. Um, so I started a residency um, eight years ago called Picture Berlin, and um, it came out of my experience of doing multiple residencies. and. And also moving to Berlin and understanding, we're trying to understand what the city was and what the city, city could offer. And I was interested in creating an opportunity for other artists to kind of become part of a, of a network that I was building. So this goes back to the network mm -hmm. question. So through my experiences of Picture Berlin, I was able to and have been able to develop this quite extensive network, especially now. But I think, um, I think that residencies can be very very, very fruitful for people. And I think um, there are many, many different kinds of residencies out there. There's the kind where people give you a key and a studio and say, have a good time, there, that's your room and that's where you're gonna stay and you're gonna work there and good luck. There's the other kind where it's really engaging, um, studio visits, talks, lectures, it's more what I'm kind of organizing and dealing with. Um, and exhibitions, there's some where they don't expect anything out of your experience. Um, on at the location, um, but I think it. Uh, I think it can be. I think adjusting your work. That was part of the question. Mm -hmm. I think uh, it's very dependent on the residency because there are so many different kinds of residencies, right. and some residencies ask you to give a plan. What are you going to do here? How are you going to focus your work on on uh, on the location that we offer on the opportunity that we're offering. Maybe there's multiple residents in the residency. Maybe you're just on your own. Maybe there's a component of the residency where you actually have to participate in the community in giving talks or workshops or what have you. So I think it's it's very dependent. There's so many different types of residencies. And sometimes the work does, in my experience, my work has changed or morphed because of the situation. But it's surprisingly so. I've gone to places and just been the Malay colony in um, in New York and in the winter and there were five other residents but I didn't see them it was really cold to leave the studio <laughs> so we just met in the kitchen so 
Yeah, I mean. From the, from the, from the back end side, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm curious to know if artists that participate in, in Picture Berlin, are they there as like another notch on their accomplishment belt to, uh, to get into other opportunities or they tend to be there mostly just for the experience or to work on a body or is it a combination? Combination, I think a lot of people are there for it to be a notch on their resume and because Picture Berlin offers two exhibitions, that's also a nice ah. thing to have on the resume and at the end the residents get a catalog. So they get a printed document with their work in it, with a, a curatorial statement written about their work. They have this show that they're working together with a curator. They meet a lot of curators in the program as well, one-on-one -on -one portfolio reviews. So there's a lot of opportunities for them to build their network within Berlin, and that's the idea of the program. So yeah, I think it's very much about a notch, and I think it's, but it's also, people have gotten back to me three and four years later and said, wow, I'm still actually unpacking what I got out of that experience. And there's so there was so much packed into this seven week period in the summer that I, I'm trying to understand it still. And it's, so that's really exciting to hear that it has, it, that the experience um, stays with people for a long sure. time. Yeah. Yeah, I've been thinking about residencies a lot. I was th we were invited to do a residency in Banff and I think that was a really interesting one because I think we learnt more from the students that we were teaching than perhaps they learnt from us. Is <laughs> that in Toronto? Is that in Toronto? Or? Uh, Banff, no, it's near, well, the nearest place is like Calgary, but they have oh, this okay. huge centre and they had this fantastic residency called Almost Perfect. And we learnt about open source software there. And for us, ah, through the yeah. engagement of the people, we completely changed the way in which we practice and the way in which we work through what some of the students were doing there, which was great. But now, I just to be very honest, and this is very much the time of life that I'm in and the situation that I'm in, I find it increasingly hard because I can't commit um, as a parent to going away for several months at a time. So I now have this problem where I can commit to maximum two weeks and no more. And I, I'm in a group now um, called Kinder Kunstkarriere, looking at children and making art and, and career stuff. And there's only one place in the whole of Germany that lets you go there with a kid. And most of the people that get a place there just end up sleeping. So, you know, I mean, there's something, because they're so exhausted and they just need the time out. But I mean, I, I really think there's a lot of, you know, it depends on the location. I've had, a, you know, great ones in, uh, in Denmark and Norway and going to fantastic places. It does make a difference. But interestingly, last time I was in Norway, there was another little talk going on about residencies, and there was a philosopher there called Dieter Lassange who made a very controversial statement where he said, listen, people, you know, you might have beautiful spaces to offer everybody, but actually they just want the money to stay at home. And I thought, I mean, everyone was absolutely outraged and, and terrible and <laughs> very offended, but I think they have a point. You know, there's yeah, plenty yeah, of people yeah. in Berlin that would really like to just be uh, able to yeah. stay at home. I was buying the cash yeah. from it. Yeah, like unrestricted grants. You know, Can I just follow that? Because I was going to say, I never really did any residency. Well, I did things that, were, that called themselves residencies. Like I went once to Sicily for 10 days and just ate food on a tour and they <laughs> called it an art residency in which I was then supposed to be inspired and leave and make work. But it, like the, the word yeah, residency yeah. was just like <laughs> bandied about like a kind of cool thing. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. to be honest, I built a studio here that has everything I need to do what I do exactly. and I just yeah. want a residency in my own studio yeah. to be left alone to do my work. Yeah. And But I understand like I think a residency if I'm really stuck and I need some new perspective, going away somewhere to just change everything, because sometimes that's what an artist, you just need to see things yeah. from a fresh yeah. perspective, yeah. so that could do it. But right now, like I got a lot of ideas and I just have not enough time to make them, and I would love a residency where someone just says, like, go to your studio and you know, lock me in my own studio and just, you know, not bother me. Right. That would be a great residency. Right. But, yeah. I was, I've done a number over the years all over the place between um, the states and here, but I actually, right now I'm kind of struggling with one that I've, I'm nominated for one where I have to come up with a proposal and an application in the next couple of weeks. And I had to think about the part of the question that you asked, or one, one of the questions was the, you know, adjusting the work towards the residency and like trying to do something right. that yeah. fits it. And um, this upcoming one is in Los Angeles, and actually all my art heroes are from L.A. I love so much of the art that comes from L.A., even though I never lived there. However, I'm apprehensive to simply dive too deep into that as a 
context for the statement because also there is an awareness that this jury may not be so interested in <laughs> those particular artists. Maybe they got drunk and, and got into a fight or something. Who knows? I mean, there's. I don't want to overthink all this too much, and I'm not. I'm not trying to like be too complicated. I'm just trying to think. Well, they want. They want something that's relating to LA, and I can definitely come up with that, but at the same time, I'm also really interested to do whatever the hell I want when I'm in my studio or when I'm working on a project. So in a way, I can imagine that could have an impact if the deadline's coming up that I'm not there yet with something that it might not be such a great idea or it might not you know, work out that I get it because the idea doesn't fit with what, why, what I want to do and what they need to give me. And so those are weird situations that they kind of present themselves in this particular context. I'm not used to this personally, so I'm still figuring this out. You know, it's like still like a new thing for me because I've done other residencies where no one gives gives a damn. You can do whatever you want. So I'm kind of curious about how this turns out. You know, but normally I'm very happy. Just like John said, I'm very happy to be in my studio, which is set up to do what I need to do. Um, and yeah. The production makes much more sense in Berlin, especially with the materials and all the other stuff that I have to do. With. I, can I just add some? It's so dependent on your on like what it is that you're doing. Because like I, yeah, I yeah. have friends that are right, like fiction writers, and res they just float all year round, mm -hmm. residency to residency. Mm -hmm. They just bring their laptop, and they're just yeah, constantly cable. like they've yeah. done 27 residencies or something in a few years. And mm -hmm. for me, it's like I have to be dropped into some foreign place and figure out where's the art supply store uh, yeah, right. and get some canvases. I can't bring the oil paint because it's right. flammable. So it's like, it's wow. just a, a nightmare. But if, if, if I could work in a more conceptual fashion or writing or something, it could be fantastic. But <laughs> Do now studies. I need to rethink my whole work. <laughs> <laughs> I think yeah, it's yeah. about yeah. I think it's about the desire to have just the space and the freedom to do your work and not to be annoyed with all the everyday life stuff that you have to do and and to really concentrate on one project or on one thing you want to work on and not to be distracted too much. I think this is what, what I enjoy so much about it. Um, but but now also I have a kid and I. There's a second one coming, and and together with my partner we also run a company together. And we have now residency coming up next year, four four weeks residency, and we have no idea how we're going to do it. It's in Leipzig. It's just around the corner. It's not far away. But still, I mean, our our young son he's not going to be able to go to kita to kindergarten. Mm -hmm. So what are we going to do with him? Who do we take him to work? And so finally, would third <laughs> so grandparents. Uh, yeah, I'm not sure. <laughs> Get one of those lamps that has a timer. A friend of mine did that at one where the, a, it made the light go on and off in his room. And it just looked like he was there. <laughs> was like, you know, yeah, he did this because he, he didn't want to be in this village somewhere. And he was just like, whatever, just give me the money. And he just basically had this light going on and oh, off. Oh, I think you're saying with the child. Yeah. No, not the child. No, no. <laughs> No, he's a parent too. I think maybe, but he was just like, I, I want the money from this grant, and you know they were giving him like a thousand bucks a month, which is often the case with a lot of European residencies. They function like this, and he just didn't want to go to this village, so he, he got a timer on the lamp. No yes, one, but, but yeah, I mean, so maybe that works. Yeah. <laughs> but for no, having, oh, no, but but having, I think uh, I can understand the desire of having a residency in in the in the place where you live actually, and where you have you know in the case of having a family that um, you know you have everything organized, but just having the space of it. But I would really would like to to answer to the question of you know if there is a certain topic of residency, and that reminded me also of if you get invited to festivals, I don't know, to do a project there, or to do a little performance or whatever um, uh, that fits to a certain topic. I think this is also always a, a kind of compromise. Uh, for, for me personally, I give myself a timeline and if I haven't found any idea or some, some kind of connection to to, to to the topic of the festival or whatever is, uh, 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 the question is, or the offer is, um, I don't do it. It really has, has to, to, to fit to what, what your interests exactly. are and don't yeah. come really, I don't know, because it can be a real pain if you, if you feel like you have to do something and it just doesn't feel right. Yeah, you know, no, so, yeah exactly. Yeah. But to, to your point again about being isolated and being able to work on a particular project is extremely helpful. So I, I did a residency because I had a specific show coming up, but I had to 
just get away. And I had my own studio anyway, but it was just a different state, different location. I did have to you know, go to a lumber yard and figure all that mm -hmm. stuff out and a, a, a quarry, but that was sort of the excitement of it and the challenge of it too. But then again, when I did the residency, the innovators one, no, which that was a whole theoretical one, mm -hmm. but that was great because I was here and away and then in a whole different space, not even doing visual work necessarily. So it kind of can be practical to just get things done, but it can also be a way to take you away from where you are now to sort of recharge and rethink. And, and even your, the proposal you have, that could be really interesting to me, like your upcoming potentiality, even though you don't know, but it could open up something else. Yeah, you know, definitely. Think, sure. That's the idea. Um, we, can can, I, can, can yeah, I say one thing? I, I was just actually surprised by this question as well, that this was even on the list of questions because it's such a specific, like, residencies. It's like, uh, I'm, you know, why not talking about grants or, the, you know, whatever. It's like such a specific technical kind of thing that... Um, Who asked it? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> you don't have, you don't have to no, but, but no, it's a great question. It's just that, like, I think that often when I see an artist's resume today, it's the residencies they've done are all like these notches on the belt thing that you're saying is right. like it's listed right. off and then right. you, if you see enough of them you get this impression that oh boy I guess I should do some residencies because it seems like everyone went to this degree residency residency this degree and then I think boy I'm I'm really not worthy of my network of friends. Really <laughs> but I it's think that's totally. So, 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 so his point is that you know they're coming from a different generational perspective yeah, than we yeah, are. Yeah. You know. But I, I think I mean to be fair I think there seems like there is total use value in residencies. They can completely radically inspire and change everything. But then they for some people completely unnecessary and pointless. <laughs> I mean, I just, I mean, for, for me, I'm such a creature of habit, I can't, I, it sounds like more work than I need to do a residency, but I would rather just have a vacation. But, um, but, but I can also understand that, yeah, if I have, I mean, I can see the, the use value. I just think that so, it's such about the personality of the, of the yeah, artist. Yeah, I think you're totally right. Yeah. I agree. Uh, Moving along, yeah, because we don't sure. have much time and we want to open the floor up to some questions. I have one last question yeah. for the panel, and this is really just about um, career don'ts. If you could just walk, we'll go down the line and just say one definitely don't do. It could be anything. It could be having to do with applications. It could have anything to do with networking. It could have anything to do with anything. Just one simple don't do this. Remember, don't do that. And then we'll open up the floor for questions. Mine, I'll go first. Do not send angry letters to anyone, especially if it's for a grant. It's a small community, and it comes around, and if you're a granting institution, we remember who you are. So don't ever do that. You might be all excited to hit send, you're like frustrated, I got rejected, I just want to do it. Don't. Or at least wait till the next day. Breathe on it. We've had people send them to like our executive director, everyone, and we're just like, this person is insane, wow. and you just blacklisted yourself. So yeah. don't do that. <laughs> yeah, I've, I've, was this on the list of questions or no? Because <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm sorry, I feel, we can jump over. Uh, it. Yeah, it was. It was, it was, it was okay, number I nine. I, I didn't read it. <laughs> I'm just feeling. Don't I, I, question I, the moderator. You no, know, I try to come up with some <laughs> like you know my fortune cookie wisdom that I'm like, oh, don't do that. I would say, don't hurry so much. I mean, don't, don't hurry and don't worry. It's like, <laughs> no, but I mean, honestly, it's like, there is this impulse that if you're not Jean-Michel Basquiat by the time you're 25, mm -hmm. you're Very over. Yeah. And I think yeah, that yeah, yeah. the reality is, it's a long, it's like a slow game. Yeah, slow it's game. like, it's easy, it's so easy to be the cool new thing, like your first exhibition or performance or something. It's really difficult to be relevant at your 10th or 20th or, for, you know, further down the road. It's a, it's a really, it's a slow game. And I think you should be nice to everyone on the way up because you will see them on the way down. And then back up again, back down. But you know, like you were saying, yeah, yeah. Don't, no angry letters, don't be in a hurry. Oh my god, so many don't. <laughs> um, we can start a thread later. So. Right. <laughs> we're just giving you one, right? Yeah. Just, okay. Yeah. I, I, I think, um, 
don't walk into a gallery with your portfolio under your arm and expect yeah. that the curator or the gallerist is going to want to look at your your portfolio. I really think that's a big don't. Yes. Don't do that. Yeah. I find it really hard to answer this question. I'd rather say what well, the do's. I'd mm. rather I don't know. Maybe maybe I do a don't, which turns into a do. So so don't do something that you. <laughs> don't want to do <laughs> so do what you want to do <laughs> so just I don't know trust do do trust your it. instinct trust your desire and trust your I don't know your your personal interest and follow it I mean this sounds like a, a bad uh, coach a, co a phrase from coaching but uh, <laughs> you know <laughs> I don't know just just um, don't be scared of maybe that's that's I say it because I felt like my 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 youth was so there were so many restrictions I had to get rid of and I had to, to, to somehow fight for doing what I wanted to do. And um, and I'm glad I did so just go for it and <laughs> do stuff. Yeah. I'm gonna yeah. kinda echo yours because it was like what I was wanting to say was very similar, but maybe uh, change around a bit. But I, I guess if I was gonna say one thing right now it'd be like don't not trust your gut, like, so that is kind of a do thing, yeah. but like, trust your gut, I mean, Jesus, there's so many people you're going to meet, and so many situations you're going to get into, where there's no guidebook to it, you just don't know what's up with the people, or you might hear different things, you know, like, oh, that gallery's great, or that gallery sucks, or, oh, this curator, you gotta stay away from him, or, oh, he's, really, he's important. really important, all these things, and I think this is where you gotta kind of rely on some mysterious instinct, very often that helps a lot, I think, with a lot of this too. Where to put your energy, who to trust, yeah. those kinds of things. It's just a continuation of what you both said. Don't work mm -hmm. with people that make you feel really uncomfortable yeah. and mm -hmm. find creepy and give you weird yes. vibes. Just yes. don't bother, yeah. Yeah. just leave it. You don't have Absolutely. to. People you feel exploited by, people you feel, you feel mm -hmm. yeah, that put you under pressure or, yeah. Great. Questions? How do you as an artist, at least this is something I'm struggling with and I don't know if it's just because I'm young or if this will continue forever, which is a very terrifying thought, but like how do you answer the question of like what am I doing, why am I doing this, do I have anything worth saying, there's so much going on, like why don't I leave space for other people to do this, like should I be doing something else, like, how do you decide when you should push through with something and when you should say like oh. Maybe I should do something else. Do you mean a project or anything? Or project, or like or? goal in general. Like, how did you decide? Yes, I'm gonna keep making art. Like, you just feel compelled to. Well, there's like, if the opposite is you just, then you don't do that thing. Right. Is there a void, or do you do something else then? You know, I, I feel like just you do something, and then you see, like you make or you do whatever you're doing. And then you kind of assess it a bit. Did you enjoy it? Was it successful in your mind? Did you get something from it? Does it look just like someone else's? Do you, did it not turn out? And then you just fine tune it. You know, you kind of just, you do something and then you do something else and something else and you keep going. But I don't think there's like a master plan of like, I am going to be the person who <laughs> makes these and <laughs> no one else has done this, you know? I, I mean, think it's also like the trust your gut thing yeah, too. Yeah, I sure. think you can try and work on many different things and, and maybe put something aside, but if it's really important to you, it comes back. Mm -hmm. I have ideas that I'm like thankful that I wasn't making art a lot then because it would have been crap. So well, what's the, the worst thing's gonna happen? You made some I crap. Mess like, uh, time and crap? Yeah, I mean, but, but, oh, but no one has, the, because that time was met, spent doing something more positive right. and more and better to my career. Yeah. So that's yeah. why I didn't yeah. do it. But then the things that did stick around, then they became more important. So the important things stick. Yeah. I, I've had that's ideas true. that I had for 10, 12 years and yeah. wasn't ready to execute because I couldn't really do it. Yeah. That didn't mean I didn't do anything between that time. I, no, no, I was no. able to expand and do other things. So the, the, the true important things circle back. The stakes are lower than you think. You just have to do something. I mean, it's not like you're gonna make the wrong decision and your life was a waste or something, you know? It's like you just, you adapt, you know? I mean, you no, I just wanted to say, I think ideas are really easy. Follow through is really the hard part. And I 
think you, I think trusting yourself, and it, it's just, I'm just reiterating the crowd here, just trusting yourself and going with really what you believe is true, and for some reason that idea got generated in your mind for whatever reason, why not explore pros and cons? How, how, what, what, what would the end result look like? And again, would, and um, also I think something interesting to think about is how are you gonna feel if you don't do it? How, what do you think, how does that make you feel? If you think about, okay, if I don't do it, would I feel bad, actually, if I didn't follow through with that? Or what, do I feel really excited, is my excitement overriding my doubt? And it's just baseline believing in yourself. And that is such a hard thing to generate in yourself. But I think that is really kind of where you have to nurture yourself mm -hmm. and really believe. Sorry, okay. And I just want to follow up with the, the stakes are low. I think that's that, that kind of gives you, it relaxes you to, to, you know, to, to, to think, okay, you can take a side path, you can take another side path, you, yeah. you, it's okay, I mean, look at all of us, we've all, you know, our path, it's not been like this, we've done this and this and parallel or triple things at the same time, and it kind of, um, it kind of influences each other, there are these, you know, they, they have an impact on each other, all these different side paths that you take, and um, they will make your career, however it is, and it will make you what, what you are and what you have done on, and, and also sometimes maybe, maybe it's a side path that says, okay, I need, to t I need a break, I need to just have a couple of months off, or I'm, I'm just, I'm, I'm, I'm having a family now, and I'm taking time off from, from professional work, and that will feed back into your professional work, because we, being an artist, you know, it's, it's so the, the, the boundary between living and making art is so close, so you, you get inspiration from just living, yeah. <laughs> so mm. I think, uh, don't worry too much, and <laughs> you'll get there. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Just add real quick, I think also as you get older, your ego develops. And of course, it could go in a crazy direction, like writing 3,000 bad emails to <laughs> the grand people. But of course, if you keep things on track, you let your ego develop too. And the things that are um, uh, kind of like your, the people around you or the experiences you have around you add to your confidence. And it also kind of it becomes a positive cyclical thing, I found, personally, too. Like, it's not always about production, it's not always about sales, it's a, it has to do with the bigger picture of things. And, and so I like to think that at least, yeah, I've, I've had confidence that's built up over the years from just being inside it and dealing with the, the rough times. You know. But that doubt, that'll never go away though. Is this good? <laughs> I mean, honestly, like I go every single day and it's like, I don't know, is this good? Yeah, Do I even like no, this anymore? Normal. Like, what? Yeah. I mean, yeah. It's totally normal. Yeah, it never goes yeah. away. Yeah. But I think one of the maybe we can come back to the education system. Yeah. And I think one of the things that I've been struggling with for years is like this reactive and proactive. So when people ask you in the world to make some art, then you sort of feel like, okay, I have to do it because they asked for it. But then how do you get over that thing of like, no one asked for this piece of art, but I'm going to make it anyway. Like, how do you get yourself, how do you trick yourself into doing that? And one of the things that's great about being in education is that people ask you for stuff all the time. <laughs> and you're in a structure of people asking for things from you. And I think that's quite good because it, it forces you to practice being reactive. And then it's like, I've just got to do something. So they keep, they're asking it from me, so I have to make it. Yeah, there's a structure thing yeah. that's connected with what we're doing here. It's true. Yeah. I, think, I think even for me also, making it is my decision. And I don't care who sees it or who doesn't. It's my, your own sort of personal therapy in a way. Yeah. Yeah. You know, getting what is here someplace else, you know, and that's sort of what keeps it level. Mm -hmm. There's a question here, yeah? Yeah, I think one of you already talked about this, but uh, how do you yourselves relate to rejection and competition? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I don't want to talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's, you know, I, I just got rejected a week ago. Um, Me too. <laughs> I'm gonna here for you, man. <laughs> um, I think the more you apply for things, you just understand it's the nature of it, and it's just and it's again, it's very subjective. It's also the timing of it, where you are, where if being on the backside of panels, um, it depends on the energy in the room. Uh, you know, all kinds of circumstances, the energy of the panelists, how they're feeling. You have to just understand that what you're presenting isn't necessarily you. It's it's a it's an iteration of your work in this sort of framework of whatever you're applying for. Um, it always hurts a little bit, but it hurts less as time goes on. You know, that's what you're saying. Yeah. I think that a 
apart from doing your art and doing your work, do you do other works as being a teacher? And I'm sure over the years you had a lot of jobs or kind of jobs to pay the rent. And I'm wondering how you keep the balance or how you kind of prevent this thing, like, I don't know, being a teacher or, you know, bar calls and stuff like, oh, you know, Judy John, you, I want you to do, like, teacher. <laughs> Dr. Judy John. Do you, like, three classes a week, not probably three days a week, how do you keep this balance of, like, well, I like teaching, but I also need my time or when you do jobs that you have to do, how do you, I don't know. There was, there was a painter I admired that visited my school as a visiting artist when I, when I was an uh, undergrad. And um, he said, never more work more than three days a week. You give yourself one, you have one day of, out of the seven that's your rest day. So three days money jobs, three days fun time studio. Uh, that's impossible <laughs> in New York, though. I don't know anyone in New York who does that. But well, yeah, th but this, guy, but then you find money jobs that are. I mean, okay, but this is. I'm oh, sorry. This is one perspective. This is one perspective, but you know, in Berlin, this is way doable. I mean, you can totally you can work yeah, one true. day a, a week yeah. here and <laughs> and live you know decently. But I think you find that balance. You know, like obviously you need you need time to do whatever it is that you want to do. So. Finding whatever that balance is, you know. For me, I think that's that's pretty great. Like if I if I were to find myself teaching three days a week, that would be hitting that limit of okay, uh, it's cutting into my studio time, which for me is my priority. Uh, you know, that's my first job. Uh, but yeah, sorry. No, I think it's really hard. I'm still struggling with the balance thing. Mm -hmm. I'm maybe have too many hats on right now. <laughs> but yeah. I, I think it's I think it's really tough and I think it's um, and I also think, you know, the older you get the and the continued dedication you have to your practice, you uh, you know, you have more things to pay for. You have your life is just expensive and stuff just happens and I don't know, that's not a very good <laughs> thing to say. But it's true. I think um, just balancing is, is really hard. That's a that's something I've always, I, it's a personal struggle for me, I've always, always had. So maybe I'm also not the right person. Well, I think, I've, I've, I'll speak because I'm coming from a 16-year gig that was 9 to 5, but, you know, it's longer than 9 to 5, it's like 9 to 8 or something like that. And so it's finding the time to make your practice, finding the time to work differently, so it didn't necessarily have to be bronze metal work or stone work. Maybe you do something different that you can do, that it's drawn, you can do something digitally. Um, but it is finding that time, and life happens, and things change, and there is time where I was happy to be working creative, creatively in this sector and not necessarily on my practice, because if I was doing all these ideas that I had, I'd be wasting that time on not great ideas, so I would do the ones that I really wanted to, when I wanted to, and then find the time to do that. It gets super subjective, of course, and it depends on where you are, because I was in New York, and it's, you know, it's very challenging to earn a living there, but also I was in a, a space where all these creative ideas were coming, and that was really feeding me, too, mm -hmm. uh, artistically and creatively. Um, and so now I have tons of time, uh, <laughs> which is also <laughs> weird. I don't know what I do with myself. Um, so that's also a weird contrast too. Yeah. Can I just say something real quick? It's just like kind of addressing everyone here. I'm just kind of like thinking as much as you can, build up skills. If you're going to go towards art and if you know that you need to financially deal with something on the side because you might not be selling art as soon as you graduate, do everything in your power to build up skills that create a, a side job of some sort or a side profession that pays a lot per hour and something that you can do. Like think about doing something that exactly fits into this thing of like three days a week mm -hmm. and you have your bases covered and you have the skills to kind of develop this, which may or may not be something Bard can offer. I mean, be objective about this. I, I think this is an important thing to consider as well too, yeah. because there's one thing that there's, there's some amazing things that are offered here, but maybe that what it, you need to, to make that hourly wage, maybe that's not available here, and maybe it has to be somewhere else. Or find a gig, like, maybe it's in a, a photo lab, where you can get, there's some sort of Possibly. benefit to, mm -hmm. to the job that you have, if it's yeah. a sort of, some right. kind of standard hourly rate, but there's some other additional benefit to that. Possibly. Marry a wealthy person. That's a good idea. Marry a wealthy person. <laughs> <laughs>
I was wondering, you talk so much about how to make money, but isn't there also a big art world out there that's based on like community-based living, where you could just go and live with people, live with your friends, make art, and you get some art back, and you just travel around. Isn't that an option, rather than always having to depend on money? I mean, there is there are concepts like or collectives um, in, in the performing art worlds, for example. They also work, you know, they live in Berlin. They they have, you know, they 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 have to pay their rent or mortgages or whatever they have. But um, what what they try, like uh, got, um, um, uh, collectives like Shishi Pop, for example, or uh, Gob Squad, they have what a kind of internal social system. They don't work, to, uh, they don't live together, or you know. Uh, uh, how do you say self, um, self, self -growing. yeah, or the, you know, self, self sustaining, self yeah, sustaining. exactly, self sustaining. But what they have, they, they build up their own kind of social system. For example, if someone uh, has a child, uh, he or she gets um, some kind of extra money, or everyone is allowed an extra amount of money to to take uh, at some point in her or his life, for example. Or um, so they, they try as much as they can, but to, to to establish a kind of own social system within their collective. That is an option, but it takes a lot of effort, and it also needs a uh, means for, for these companies, especially they're very successful. They earn enough money so they can actually afford to do this. Um, of course, it's always an option to live an alternative life, but. Uh, the, the question is... I mean, it all yeah. comes with a lot of dependency, because then you're dependent on so many other people rather than on this one person that lives. So it's a choice if you want to you need to be able to just go out and do whatever you want, or you have this whole group of people that depend on you and you depend on them. But there are models, just to let you know, there are models in Berlin and just outside Berlin. So there's so there's a house called Kula where you can live very, yeah. very cheaply, or you can go to Ponderosa, which is just outside of Berlin, yeah. and make work and live there quite cheap. So there are kind of more community-based models where it's not necessarily what you're getting from the situation is going to be a lot of money, but rather you'll probably be eating cheaply, you'll be sharing your work with other people. So I think that, that it is possible to do it like that. I think art is always about energy and inspiration. And I would like to know where did you get those things? It's because you know sometimes when you feel down you want to be uh, creative and art is about also creativity so where do you get the inspiration and energy um, uh, I'm in this weird situation as I said before a lot of the projects that I do are public fu publicly funded so me and, and especially my partner, we are very often in this weird situation that we have to produce something because we got money for it. And even though it was our own idea, it feels like, but it's not the right time. And we just had a premiere, so that we have a next one coming up. And if we don't do it, we have to get the money. We t have to uh, to give the money back, and we risk of not getting another funding afterwards because you know you just have to deliver, no matter if you had a child or if you know no matter what your life circumstances are. And it's on the one hand a very lux luxury um, situation, but on the other hand it produces a pressure of you know you feel like a factory and you feel like maybe I'm, this is not art anymore or it, it kind of. But on the other hand, sometimes it gives you a structure to work in, and you are somehow forced to, to um, in a, in a pro also productive way, to to sit down and think about what do we actually want to do, what what is it where we are at, and 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 we have this ritual that we meet once a week, and we. We, we, we sit down for an hour or two and, and discuss our further projects or what we are you know what we're at now and so we, we kind of make a, made a virtue out of, out of necessity <laughs> so yeah for me it's about being open to being um, I, I used this word last week like oh had an invitation from somebody else and I said I'm open to contagion. And it happened, and it was great. It was just like, it's and so that what we were talking about earlier about networks and going to see people's work and sharing works from from supporting this um, 
they were actually a group of ex-students that carried on doing a format, and they did it after 18 times. They said, hey, really interesting, you come to do something now. And they invited two other people I'd never met before. And through the whole situation of not knowing people, being open to stuff, being invited by people that I've taught before, and actually it was super fruitful, fantastic experience, and I found it really inspiring. And maybe it is to do with this freedom through restriction. You know, like, yeah. we only had three or four days. It wasn't very much time at all. But we had a really fantastic time together, and I found it, I find other people inspiring. Yeah. i just say real quick, um, for me, at least as an artist, I mean, there's a lot of art I see all the time, and a lot of it, most of it, does not inspire me or touch me. And I think that's, for a lot of us, normal. Mm -hmm. The moments that it does, the, the times that I see something that, are, that really hits me, it stays with me, I ask myself, why is that? And there's so often inspiration outside of the arts completely. Like, I really, I really enjoy being perturbed by things that I don't understand so much, and it, sti it sticks with me, and this finds its way as a seed somehow into, into some other weird adventure, some, some journey. That's how, I, that's how it's been for quite a while, so I trust that. For me, it's been really, um, I said it in the beginning, I think work begets work. I mean, when, when I'm working on something, um, I, uh, instead of kind of focusing on that one thing, I kind of burst with ideas and I get more and more ideas. So I, I feel very fueled. Um, I've been doing a regular, uh, so that's just my practice and how it works for me when I'm really concentrated on something, but I've been doing a, a long-term project, some of you know about it, it's called Zontag, and um, I do this with my partner every month, we've been doing it for five and a half years, and uh, side plug, we're doing one on Sunday, <laughs> but um, I, I have to say there are so many Sundays, so many lead-ups to that project where I just feel like I don't want to do this. I do not, I, I'm exhausted, I can't do it, I have no, I don't have any motivation for this, I have no energy, and fortunately I, it's, I'm doing this with my partner, so he will pull me up and say, come on, we got to do this, let's make, make it happen, and it's always the same thing. When it's over, we're so happy. We're like we feel elated. We feel like pumped with energy and excitement and enthusiasm. And I think that's this thing of like pushing through. Just when you don't, when you feel down, especially pushing through and making it work anyway, and finding finding the energy because it is there, and forcing yourself. And I think that's the interesting thing of not being like being a practicing artist outside of an academic world. Um, is that you don't have teachers saying, okay, where's the assignment? You said you, you know, this was, it's due today, where is it? You know, there's no one there behind me telling me to do that. I created that project and I am that person. It's like the same for you, you know? Y you, you are that person kind of breathing down your own neck to make that happen and to follow through. And the deadlines never disappear. They're always there, looming for applications or what have you. So needing to be inspired or needing to find inspiration, I think the word inspiration is a little bit overused for a word um, because this is, this is what I do. This is my job. I'm an artist. I, this is part of what my life. This is, this is it. And there's, it's not about inspiration. It's about how I'm living. I don't know if that makes sense. This kind of sounds a bit dramatic, but... <laughs> yeah, it's yeah, dramatic. Uh, yeah, I mean, this kind of artistic block, I guess, is sort of connected to what you're saying. Like, where do you find it? I, uh, right now, I just say meditation. Like, I just... If I'm feeling blocked in the studio, meditate. And then... It comes. But... I don't know, different points in my life. It was like heavy metal, drugs, partying, films, music. Uh, but those are good problems to have. I would much rather have the problem of, you know, I have a studio and I have time to be in that studio and now I don't know what to do. I love, that's like a good, <laughs> I mean, that struggle that to find yeah. something is great, but. Yeah, it is actually a good feeling. I mean, it's, a, it's <laughs> about yeah. freedom, you know, yeah. you have the freedom yeah. to get lost and not have any ideas and find an idea. So, mm -hmm. so yeah, I mean, today I would meditate. But, uh, For me, uh, art's about communication and I draw inspiration just from everyday experiences in the world. 
And the challenge is how do I re-communicate that, even like thinking it, and that's the expression too. So even if I don't have a studio and I don't have some way, mechanism to do that, I'll find other means, you know? And so I play guitar badly, so last night I needed to express, and I was just playing some bad guitar, but it was fun. It was just me alone and a couple beers, and it was great. Uh, but it didn't have to be me making a piece for something. It just had to just be getting out mm -hmm. your, your voice, even if it's to yourself. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, there's, there's always times where there are ups and downs. It's life in general. But I think what we all said is this, our continued constant in our thread is that sort of expression. And there isn't a straight path. It's a path that meanders and goes on tangents, but it always kind of comes back to the same thing, which kind of drives us all which I think is uh, kind of the connecting factor, which is kind of why we're all here, so. Mm -hmm. yeah. Seems like a good note to close. Yeah. <laughs> so thank you all. Thank you.